Hi, my name is Gisette reyes Soffer. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. My lab has been studying lipid and lipoprotein metabolism for over 18 years. And today I am here to speak to you about a favorite lipoprotein of ours for the last couple of years, lipoprotein little A. Let's get to your questions. Lipoprotein little a is a lipoprotein that's been linked to cardiovascular disease. What I mean by cardiovascular risk is that you can get a heart attack, you can, you're at increased risk for having a stroke, it's been linked to aortic stenosis, and it's also been linked to peripheral um, arterial disease. It is genetically determined, so it's carrying your genes, and the way that it causes disease, we believe, is because it has this ApoB, which is also in your LDL, that we measure in your blood. And we think that it's creating risk because of that. But it also, in addition to it, has this apolittle little A. And that apolittle little A may be linked to inflammation and coagulation pathways. This was an interesting question because I had to like think about it for a little bit. So do people measure proteins once you are deceased. So I would say no. And the reason for that is because LPA is affected by inflammatory profiles. So depending on your cost of death or how long postmortem, then the levels are going to be different than what you expect. So I'm not sure. I You can do genetic testing. So there is some SNPs within, there's some rare variants within the LPA gene that have been identified to be linked to higher levels or lower levels of LPA. So genetic testing would work using genes and variants to estimate what the LPA levels will be. So that would work, but I don't know if protein levels out in the sort of um, plasma would, would be postmortem would, would work. the number one thing that you can do is keep calm. There is no reason um, LPA is not an acute phase reactant where you're going to have an event the next day you discover that your LPA is high. And I think what's really important is educating yourself through programs like, you know, the Family Heart Foundation has where you can see the latest data and not what's hot on Twitter or social media. And so I think that knowledge is power. And I think that having that knowledge to understand that high LPA levels do not cause an event in everyone that has high LPA levels and understanding that if you have it high, you can help a family member because it's genetically determined. So even your children and that it's something that doesn't change much during a lifetime. I think the current guidelines state that everyone should be an optimal ApoB lowering therapies and cardiovascular prevention therapies. So living a heart healthy diet, exercising and getting treatments for your LDL. So I think keep calm. There's no reason to panic or have this like time bomb. Am I going to get a heart attack? I, I don't think that is a good way forward. So there hasn't been any studies showing benefit from exercise or supplements, um, things like that. Um, I think the diet question is a little tricky because diets high in saturated fats have been shown to lower LPA, but we in no way recommend that someone go on a high fat saturated fat diet because it increases your LDL cholesterol and it increases your ApoB. And we know for a fact that those diets are bad for cardiovascular health. So that's it. Not, nothing that we know of right now. So whole food plant-based diets are amazing for heart disease. There was a great study in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published, I think, either in January or February, where it compared all the diets that we provide individuals. And you can see that there's benefits for most diets. 
And again, I had mentioned that the saturated fatty acid phenomenon that it has been observed, we really don't understand it yet. And so stay away from saturated fatty acids. Not, they're not to be used for LPA lowering. Absolutely. So statins have been shown in some studies to raise LPA levels. However, until we have more concrete data, statins decrease risk of cardiovascular disease and events. And in those individuals that have indications for statins that have high LDL and high ApoB levels, you should not stop your treatments because you have high LPA. So, um, yes and no. So, yes, because high LPA levels have been proven to increase cardiovascular disease. No, because we don't know if everyone with high LPA develops an event. And so we're not 100% sure that just because you have high LPA, you're going to have disease. Although the data is pointing us that way. That, that's a good one. So um, people have seen reductions in lipoprotein little A levels during oral contraceptive use. And this is this phenomenon of um, the effect of estrogens on LPA levels. We're not really sure why. We can't understand mechanistically why it happens. There are some receptor studies that have been done. This was done in the 80s and the 90s. A lot of this work was done. But taking oral contraceptives is not a contraindication and, and it actually lowers. Um, they've seen reductions in LPA levels. It's only like 10, 15%. And so, you know, LPA levels are pretty consistent. They're not variabilities where you're going from 100 to 50. They're variabilities of, you know, I have 100 and 90 tomorrow. And, you know, it yeah. might be an assay variability, not an actual physiological variability. The answer is yes. Yeah. So the UK Biobank um, had a great study in 2021. It was a circulation paper by Patel et al. And it showed that, you know, for each X amount of LPA you have, you're increased in, you know, you have an increase in outcomes and in risk, cardiovascular risk. So yes, the answer is yes. The hard, solid data that we have is that some people believe um, the kidney to be one of the clearance mechanisms of LPA. So in kidney disease, the LPA level goes up. Um, we've already spoken about estrogen and um, sort of um, oral contraceptive stories. And then ApoB levels. If your ApoB levels go down, you may get a reduction in your LPA levels. It, pregnancy is the hormone issue again. And in trauma and in acute inflammation response, it's been shown that LPA can be high and we saw some of that with COVID-19. So it's been shown that some inflammatory processes may be linked to increases in lipoprotein A. The preliminary results and data that we have is that they're very promising. And I say promising and not outstanding because we don't know if they're decreasing events or, you know, decreasing uh, mortality. And so those are the major outcomes of most of these outcome studies that we have. But they are producing 80 to 90 percent reductions in April little A. So that is promising. We are not sure when these are going to be out for patient use. The first study, the first phase three study that is ongoing, the data should be available at the end of 2024, beginning of 2025. So we look forward to looking for that data and sort of assessing whether these are in addition to lowering LPA, which is a cardiovascular risk factor in most individuals, are they also linked to less cardiovascular disease and less uh, mortality rates. So PCSK9 inhibitors decrease LPA up to 30% in some individuals. Um, they're great 
drugs. They are now accessible in most individuals, although it takes a lot of effort on the clinician's part to get them approved for individuals. So that's been one of the limitations that we've had. But they're great drugs and they do decrease LPA by 15 to 20 percent. But again, that 15 to 20 percent, we're not sure what the benefit, cardiovascular benefit is to that. Is that enough to get us to where we need to be that patients are not at risk anymore? No, I, I wish everybody heard of LPA because that would make my job more relevant. <laughs> um, that would make my job relevant, but I, I think we're getting there. So LPA has, it was discovered in 1963. We know that. The reason we didn't really know about it was because there was some data early on, I think it was in the 80s or 70s, that didn't really link it to cardiovascular disease. But then the large GWAS, um, Genome Y Association studies um, and EPI studies came out and they really showed that LPA is associated with disease risk and, you know, number one genetic risk factor for aortic stenosis. So I think that those studies really drove the system to start rethinking about how this particle is creating disease in individuals. And we don't talk about it because it's hard to think about having something elevated in your blood that's causing disease with no treatment. And so when you go to the physician and you have that conversation and they tell you, well, we don't really have a treatment, but we can, you know, prevent all other risk factors. And there's a lot we can do. And so um, it's just not a targeted treatment as of now. Well, thanks everyone for your questions. I really appreciate it. I value the time you took to put them together. I hope I answer most of them. I encourage you to continue to visit the familyheart.org website for information about high LPA and resources that they have available. There's a lot of information on studies that are ongoing, and they can also put you in contact with the Family Heart Foundation Care Navigators who can help you to assess your local resources, which I think is a great sort of way to um, learn and find out how you can go somewhere to actually be treated.